Hi there! I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of my last couple of weeks in reading. The most recent thing that I finished is Medic Against Bomb, A Doctor's Poetry of War. This was written by Frederick Foote, who's a former US military physician, and a lot of this is poetry that he wrote initially during the early invasion of Iraq, and then a little bit later in the aftermath. Some of it is VA hospital centric near the end. This was an interesting read in that it feels a lot like this is the author's diary. The poetry itself is not particularly skilled and was a little disappointing. A lot of the poetry that aims for a kind of traditional rhythm and rhyme seems a little, feels a little bit like it's being held back by that format because it doesn't feel like the author really had developed enough as a poet to be comfortable doing that. But at the same time, a lot of the writing is very raw and honest. So it was challenging because a lot of this is very good in the sense of sharing a very specific moment in time and a very specific experience, but structurally it is not great. Later on he goes into somewhat more abstract looking poetry. Uh, you can see there's a lot of form poetry where the layout of the words on the page is a big part of it. But again, that almost felt like prose that had just been arranged to be slightly more artistic. Well, I thought this was very interesting in terms of giving his view, first of dealing primarily with Iraqi civilian casualties and then later dealing with American casualties who had been returned to the US. I didn't think it was great in terms, in actual poetry terms. So it was a little disappointing in that sense. It also doesn't get into any of the politics which I am somewhat uncomfortable by because I feel like you can't talk about being part of an invasion and presenting it as a neutral because it's not a neutral, but that's maybe more of a, a personal issue that I had. Um, still, all of that said, I was glad that I read it because it is very distinct from most of the war memoirs that I have read. So. Yeah, it was worth picking up, but not necessarily for the artistry as much as for the package. Prior to that, I read Leanne Berosamasake Simpson's The Accident of Being Lost. This is a collection that's labeled Stories and Songs, much like her earlier collection Islands of Decolonial Love was. And this is very similarly pieces that are poetry or song lyrics interspersed with short stories. This was great because it has such variety to it. There is a lot of meditations on meaning and meditations on identity and moments where you, you think the main character is texting a friend but really they're talking to Lake Ontario. It, it's just great. There's a lot in here that deconstructs the way you think art should be or the way identity should be discussed and in particular, this tended to focus on First Nations queer identity. And within that, within specifically an urban setting, metaphors are excellent hiding places, is the comment she makes in a section that is about vaginas. <laughs> and one of the later stories is set at a writer's retreat during the year that Calgary had that major flood where the hippos were rampaging downtown after they had got out of the zoo. And it's just great. It's very, uh, it captures the moment and the sort of surrealness of all of that, as well as the humor in situations that I think people think about in a very, very serious way. So yeah, I was thoroughly entertained by that. I thought it was great fun and completely worth picking up. Next up is a book that I decided to DNF, and that's Michael Pollan's Cooked, A Natural History of Transformation, which is another of his food books. I have read a couple of his other food books. I loved The Omnivore's Dilemma. I liked the book with the cabbage on the cover. I don't remember what that one was called. But I feel like at this point he has said all he needed to say and a lot of this is very, very, very repetitive. So I like reading about cooking so I might come back to this at some point in the future but I felt like the overall message wasn't any different from his other food books. And speaking of retreads, I also picked up the Mary Method continuation that is Spark Joy, an illustrated masterclass on the art of organizing and tidying up. This is 
very much a sequel to the to the life-changing magic of tidying up. It discusses a lot more case studies of people she's worked with who tidied up, and it gives a lot of more detailed illustrations of how to fold trickier items. If you're interested in how to fold trickier items, this is great. Um, I had fun flipping through this, but I'm not as enthused about this as I was prior to having packed up my house in Houston, because at that point I was very engaged in looking at how to fold things because I was folding and getting rid of and all of that. It is what it is. <laughs> Next up is Heimat by Nora Krug. This is a memoir, I almost want to call this a graphic memoir, but it's more of a multimedia book. It's done scrapbook style with photos, some drawings, and it is the author's exploration of her grandparents' generation's actions during the Second World War. Uh, the author is a German who moved to the United States for university and married an American and stayed, and she specifically married a Jewish American, and she had the experience of regularly meeting people who, upon hearing she was German, would start discussing their family's experiences during the war or during the Holocaust or make Nazi comments, and this is her unpacking her family's history and seeing what did they actually do? Were they guilty and how guilty were they? I picked this up because I saw Mel from Mel's Bookland Adventure talking about this. She herself is a German living outside of Germany. It was probably relatable on a different level. I was interested in this because I'm interested both in the idea of how people deal with inherited guilt and also because I just enjoy reading about the immigrant experience and how that impacts self-identity. Um, one of the things that the author goes into is when she meets German-Americans who are multi-generationally removed, people who are descended, for example, from the people who moved to the United States after the Franco-Prussian War, who don't have that same inherited guilt and can be, I almost wanted to say nationalistic, but I don't know that that's necessarily the right word, but it's definitely how it rings to her because her generation was raised to be more cautious about nationalism. It is very interestingly done. It's handwritten with the photos, so it really does feel like you're looking at someone's family scrapbook. The moments like this that are more of a traditional graphic novel are actually few and far between. It's much more found items and photographs. She looks primarily at the experiences of her grandparents and one uncle. The uncle was the brother of her father, who her father never met. Uh, the uncle was killed in combat in Italy, and her, her father was born then after the war, so there was, would have been a 20-year age gap between them if they had been alive. So she is very much two generations removed from the war, in a way that if her, father, if her father's brother had survived, or if her father hadn't been estranged from his older sister, it would have been more like one generation, which I thought was interesting, just because the author is about my age, I think she might be a year older than I am, but my parents are older than hers, which means that I'm, I guess, closer to the time period, which I mentioned because my father was a young child during the war and had stories about how there were Germans billeted in their backyard during the occupation. And uh, if you want a weird small world moment, her grandfather was at one point stationed in Kanaka, so this is the beach there, which has changed a lot since the 40s. I mean, it's I was just there last summer and it's changed a lot since the 80s and 90s, but... So I did have the weird feeling of, why is your grandfather on my beach? Um, so that was strange. That's a one-page aside, because she's mostly looking at the things that they did uh, at home, and were they members of the Nazi party, and if they were, why, and what did they know, and it's more about that. But for me, that one page was uh, a bit of a weird moment. <laughs> I think being part of a generic occupying force, you know, it's better than being a war criminal, but I felt a little bit like I felt with this, where he's not unpacking, why is this American in Iraq in the early 2000s? Similarly, why was this German guy in Belgium in the 1940s? The, the acceptability of that is a little odd to me, in, and in both cases. So. Uh, that was something that uh, distracted me. But in any case, it's a very interesting look at family history and how I, I think a lot of people would like easy answers and there just are no easy answers to a lot of things like that. Anyway, since there are no easy answers, <laughs> the next couple of things I read were children's books because I was reading as I was having some work done on my house, which is fully sold now. It doesn't close until December, but it's sold at least. 
The first one of those two is The War I Finally Won by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. This is the sequel to The War That Saved My Life, which I read a few months ago and quite liked. This is also something that is set during the Second World War. It's about a young British girl from London who is evacuated during the Blitz and that essentially saves her from a lifetime of horrific abuse. Her mother had basically been keeping her locked in the house and the first book dealt with her basically moving past some of that, learning to trust again, learning to get around because she had been born with a club foot and her mother, because she kept her locked up, had never done anything in terms of either surgery or physiotherapy to help her deal with that. So the result of that going on and the fr and I thought that first one did an incredibly good job of dealing with really harsh topics in a way that eight to twelve year olds could easily deal with. It really felt successful in that way. This book unfortunately was not particularly successful I didn't think. It's very similar stylistically but because the character is a little older and you would hope have mo has moved forward somewhat returning to the style of writing felt a little disappointing and because this deals less with new things and more with people getting used to their day-to-day -day reality it just wasn't as entertaining to read as an adult which could be fine if you were giving this to a child to read on their own but there is so much subtext in this that I don't think children would get all of that when they read it on their own and I know when you look on Goodreads at a lot of reviews for middle grade books you often see kids who have to re who are reviewing this because clearly a parent or teacher has told them to and looking at those reviews there was a clear sense that people weren't picking up on a lot of the subtext here which involves the guardian that these kids end up with had what is pretty clearly a partner or girlfriend who had died prior to the original story and there's a lot of dis and there's a lot of material about that in here which because it's not explicit because it that wouldn't have been something public in the 1940s but I think it makes it unclear what's going on for kids. There is also a subplot of the their guardian is tutoring a refugee from Germany who is Jewish and she's there a lot of the neighbors don't like them specifically for the Germanness. There isn't the same awareness of what was going on with the Holocaust at that time and so a lot of that is subtext and again reading reviews from actual children a lot of that seemed to be being missed which suggests that you should be reading this with the kid but it's written in a way that I think it's very tedious to read as an adult which I thought was really unfortunate because the first book was so good at dealing with such heavy issues in a way that is both appropriate for kids and entertaining to read if you're an adult reading it with a child so I was really disappointed with this one. The other children's book that I read was Hina Khan's Amina's Voice which is a story about a young girl who is getting over her shyness. Her friends are encouraging her to sing at a school festival, her teachers are encouraging her to play the piano at a school festival, her parents are encouraging her to take part in a Quranic recital competition and she's shy, she doesn't want to get through, go through all of that but she's moving through her shyness and this is about a, chi a girl who has just moved from elementary school to middle school and she's working out some of her the evolution of her relationships with her friends as well. I also loved that her parents were also very relatable and as somebody who's you know probably the same age as the parents I thought that was fun to read about. I especially liked she has an uncle who is mu her father's much older brother who comes to live with them and he's one of those very like literally religious people who's running around saying things like music is haram and her parents disagree with that and the way that the parents and the uncle deal with their disagreements I thought was was well done both if you're a parent or just adult reading this with a child you have the sense of the of that being an actual conversation that adults would have because I think in a lot of middle grade fiction the parents don't necessarily behave in ways that actual people behave in they behave in ways that will let the kids evolve in a certain way and this didn't do that the both the parents and the kids were equally relatable but it also gives the kids the message that adults can disagree about things and work it out and you know it was nice as with a lot of middle grade books this kind of goes for let's have some action at the end and there is 
a hate crime that results in property damage. No one dies or anything. It's not that kind of story. And the community comes together and they celebrate. That's not really a spoiler because most of this this story is not really about that. I always think it's a shame when there has to be something exciting happening at the end because I thought this was so successful in just dealing with the human relationships. I really loved the way all of both the parents and the children behaved in this. It was great. Anyway, that was my week. It's been a weird... No, it's not. <laughs> anyway, that was my past couple of weeks. It's been a weird kind of couple of weeks, so hopefully now that most of the house stuff is finished, it will be less weird. Anyway, <laughs> that's it for now. Ciao.